Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. The webinar will begin shortly. Thank you for joining us today. We're gonna to give it a couple more minutes to allow everyone to log on and we'll be beginning the webinar shortly. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for the webinar, Special Education During the Pandemic, Know Your Child's Rights. My name is Lisa Turner and I'm the Executive Director for TARC. I joined the organization last year after working nearly 20 years in the nonprofit world, but mostly as a mother of two daughters, one of which is 19 years old and is diagnosed with autism and other developmental disabilities. My personal experience raising my daughter fuels my drive and passion for ensuring individuals with developmental disabilities and their families receive the services and support they need to live their best life. Again, thank you for joining us today. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. This webinar will be recorded. You may use the question and answer feature to ask questions throughout the webinar. Questions will be addressed during the Q&A session live. We anticipate many questions, so if yours is not addressed due to time constraints, please email your question to Sherilyn Walton at swalton at ddadvocacy.net. We're happy to be hosting our first webinar today and are planning a series of webinars on more specific special, special education topics in October. Dates and topics will be released soon. Please follow our Facebook page for additional information. We've received a huge response in registrations with over 170 people registered across the state of Oklahoma. And we'd like to find out who is joining us now so we can better speak to the audience. You will see a poll on your screen pop up right now. Please take a moment to answer the poll. You may like myself find that you fit into more than one role, but please answer to the one that represents you most today. Thank you all for answering. If we're pulling the results up now. It looks like that 56% are parents today, um, which we expected. So thank you parents for joining. It looks like we also have um, 
a couple of educators and 13% are special education teachers or staff with the schools. Um, we also have 25% of individuals that are other. So uh, we know this is a topic that everyone is interested in and we're so glad that each of you joined today. TARC, Tulsa Advocates for the Rights of Citizens with Developmental Disabilities is a United Way partner agency and is committed to making Oklahoma a better place to live. Our mission is ensuring a high quality of life for individuals with developmental disabilities and their families through education, empowerment, support, and advocacy. One of our many programs is Family Support Services, which assists parents as they navigate the confusing world of special education and community services. This program provides resource navigation and one-on-one -on -one education support and advocacy, as well as representation at IEP meetings and other supports provided on your screen. The Family Support Program is led by Sherilyn Walton and is also staffed by Hannah Chabot, who is our Hispanic Family Support Person. Sherilyn is a licensed clinical social worker and a former special education and general education teacher. She holds a bachelor's degree in deaf education from the University of Tulsa and a master's degree from the George Warren Brown School of Social Work at Washington University in St. Louis. Sherilyn has been with TIRC for 25 years and during her time has helped thousands of students and families obtain the supports they need in school as well as after high school and throughout their adult lives. And fortunately, Sherilyn had a family emergency yesterday and is unable to join us on this webinar. However, she sends her greetings to the many parents and professionals joining us today, many of whom she's worked with over the years during her service to TIRC. These last few months have been difficult for all of us. We have had to learn new ways to do our jobs and to be present with our family and friends. It seems like everything has changed and in, some, and in many ways it all has. So today we wanna to spend some time figuring this out and what does special education look like now? I know for me and my staff at TARC, we've missed being able to meet with parents and schools in person. While Zoom is a great tool, it's simply not the same as having face-to-face -face meetings and conversations. As we begin educating students in these uncertain times, teachers and school districts have an awesome responsibility. And we as parents must remember that none of us have ever faced a worldwide pandemic. Education and special education will not look the same going forward. And we all must work together to figure out how to continue providing special education in this environment while ensuring that the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or IDEA is followed. We know virtual learning isn't ideal for any student but it's what we have to work with at the moment for most all students. Before we get started into our presentation and our guest speaker, I wanna take a moment to um, just check in with everyone. You know, these days I feel like I'm riding on a roller coaster. Um, there are times that I feel like I'm coping really well and then other times not so much. So we'd like you to take a moment to do a quick self-assessment and tell us how you're feeling today. We have a quick poll for you to take. So let's all take a deep breath and select the feeling that describes where you are right now today. Are you feeling great? Feeling okay? You're just kind of meh? You're struggling or you just feel completely empty right now? I know I may cycle through several of these feelings in a day, sometimes even in an hour. So we'll pull the results of that poll, poll up right now, just so we can see how everyone is doing. Well, good. I'm glad that many of us are just feeling okay, a few feeling great, um, but it looks like most of us are in the feeling okay, meh, or I'm struggling right now. We know there's a lot of mixed feelings and that's why we're hosting this webinar and want to help you get some answers. To do that, we've invited special education attorney George McCaffrey to join us and share his expertise as we as parents, caregivers, educators, and administrators move into uncharted waters 
as we try to do what is best for students with disabilities amidst a worldwide pandemic. I'm pleased to introduce to, to you our special education law expert, George McCaffrey. George received his law degree from the University of Oklahoma and has represented children with special needs for the past 20 years. George assists parents at IEP team meetings. He also ensures that the agreed upon terms of the IEP are implemented, and if not, will represent the parents in mediation or due process proceedings. Currently, George and his associate, Ann Livingston, are the only private attorneys in Oklahoma who represent children with disabilities. In addition, George has been a legal guardian for his grandson who has special needs for the last 18 years. As a reminder, as George is presenting, please submit your questions in the question and answers function, and we will answer those um, after his presentation. So at this time, please help me welcome uh, George McCaffrey. And George, thank you so much for joining us today. George, I believe you're mu muted. If you could hang on just a moment. Okay, I just did that. Okay, George, we can hear you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, and thank you for all the participants who have joined us. Uh, this is a very exciting time for us because uh, it's our first opportunity to speak to the parents throughout the state in a virtual manner. We hope to have many more um, uh, seminars in the future and we'll we'll discuss that later on the uh, I understand that we have uh, the uh, we have parents and we have some school district people my address today will, is going to be directed mostly to the parents uh, parents with special needs uh, and what they may expect in, in this pandemic now my discussion is going to be relatively uh, elementary so if we've got parents out there who are very, very experienced in this and you find it to be rather elementary, you're just going to have to bear with us. Uh, as Lisa said, that uh, the, the IDEA was passed in the 1970s. And since that time and up to the present time, uh, we have never experienced a situation that, that will affect special education like this pandemic is it the pandemic is is making it very uncertain not just for parents but also for people like me attorneys advocates uh, it will it will have a big effect on our alj judges who hear disputes special education disputes and it will have an effect on our federal courts if a special education issue gets to the federal court the federal judges are going to pay great deference i believe to the uh, decision of the IEP team. So we must realize that. Uh, as most of us have recognized prior to the pandemic, it was oftentimes very difficult to, uh, for a parent to challenge the decisions of the district's IEP team members. Now with the pandemic, it's even gonna be more difficult for us to convince the school district members of the team as to what is best for our child. Uh, in July of this year, the State Board of Education issued some recommendations uh, for school districts. They're they are not compulsory. Uh, and so these um, recommendations are these. There'll be th three different types of learning for our children. One is virtual which means it'll be it'll take place in the child's home two is in person it will be in this classroom or somewhere in the uh, school building and then three it will be a combination of those two it will be virtual some some days and then in in person some days um, so the we now we here one thing we've got to realize right now the schools are going to start in a certain uh, mode. For example, they may say, well, everybody's going to be in school or in person. Everybody's going to be uh, virtual. We must realize now that times, these things will change when, if and when the pandemic either gets worse or gets better. So while right now, while your school may be totally in-person learning, uh, that may change and it may revert to um, 
to um, uh, virtual learning. So we have to be aware of that. Um, I will give you an example in Edmond, Oklahoma, which is the huge school district. Uh, right now, they are providing virtual education for all students two days out of the week and in person two days out of the week. Wednesdays is off and school is being shut down for cleaning purposes. Um, so unless your district has already told you in what method they're going to start, if you don't know, you should immediately contact your district and ask them, okay, how are we gonna start this year? Uh, and the thing that I want the parents to realize is uh, they have the right to ask that the your, that their child be provided a different form of education than the school is is applying for everybody for example they may say well uh we want uh, your child to be uh virtually every day in a virtual education environment and you may say well i would like to have them in person some of those days and you have a right to ask that in in the iep team meeting um, but the iep team will have to decide uh, which way your child will be educated. Uh, now, I want everybody to understand, I've been doing this for 20 years, and I've, I've got to tell you that when you go to these IEP meetings, um, what generally happens is this, the school's version is, is represented by somebody on the team, whoever's running the team, like the principal, for example. And uh, while the parents are a member of the team, uh, your consent to what what's on the IEP or your consent on how your child is educated is not required under the law. So while you may voice your opinion and ask for your your results or, or your different forms of questions, it's not required that, that they follow your advice. It's, it's in other words, you cannot stop what the school district wants to do just because you don't consent. Um, now, if you can't convince the school to do what you want to do, you will have remedies to uh, re resort to, and I will discuss those later on in, the, in our uh, discussion here. Uh, the uh, the uh, virtual learning, uh, with, if, if, it's, if your school goes virtual, I think that you, if you have a child with, uh, with, uh, high, who is high functioning, you won't, uh, that child will not have as much difficulty in dealing with the uh, uh, virtual environment. That's, they're just capable of doing it. But if, if, the if your child is uh, severely disabled, uh, then that child is gonna have a, a big problem, I think, with being educated virtually. Uh, and the reason for this is, is obvious. And you parents out there know this, that if that your child maybe just does not function at all uh, on a virtual basis. So we have to understand that. But my, my recommendation to all parents is to go ahead and ask for as much in-person uh, education as possible, all right? If you don't ask, you won't, you won't get it. Now, let me give you an example of what, how, how this works. In Edmond, Oklahoma, right now, I have two, two uh, cl clients. Uh, one is a fairly high-functioning person, child, and when we went to the school and asked, and we had an IEP meeting, the school said, "Well, you, the only thing that's going to be offered to your child is uh, you, you. She's going to go to school two days in person, and you're going to be two days virtual, and uh, that's it." So I thought, "Okay, okay, well, that's. I guess that's what they're going to do." Well, then I, I've, I had another client now who's um, very uh, low functioning, has severe disabilities. And I went to the school in the IEP meeting and we asked for as much uh, in-person le uh, learning as we could. And guess what? Edmund said, well, okay, we'll give your child four days of in-school learning, whereas all the other students only get two days. So. You've got to ask and you've got to, like we did here in Edmond and they said, sure, well, because the child doesn't work, doesn't function very well virtually, we'll let her have four days in class. One day, of course, the whole school is closed. Um, 
so when you go before your school district and your, your IEP team meeting, you can ask for that. You can say, well, I want my child to be in person more often than you're allowing everybody else. And tell them, well, you can tell them about what Edmund is doing. And, uh, and, it, and it's gonna be very helpful to us. As I go up throughout the state now, uh, representing children, I intend to do that. I intend to say, well, look, if Edmund can do it, you can do it. And also, if we have to get it in front of a, a federal judge or an administrative law judge, I can say to the judge, judge, this is not something that's just unusual. We have one of the biggest school districts in the state that is doing it this way. That's a big help for us. Um, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about related services, speech, OT, and PT. Um, this is going to be, the, the related services are gonna be very difficult in a virtual environment. Uh, I strongly urge that you ask the school district to provide the related services of speech, OT, and PT in an in-person basis, not on the screen at home. Um, I also urge that you, that you ask the school district to provide that you have certified therapists involved in these things, not just an aide or someone like that uh, to, to do it. And ask, uh, of course, for as much time as you believe. Now the school may say, well, we'll give your child uh, 30 minutes of, uh, of speech uh, every, once every two weeks. Well, no, you can say, well, I want, to, I want them to have 30 minutes three times a week. And you have the right to ask for all this, but you, we, we, we can't guarantee that we'll get it, but you have a right to ask. Uh, I'm very concerned that some of the districts will attempt to reduce or even eliminate providing of related services. Uh, either they're, 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 they, may, they may just eliminate it completely or try to do it in group sessions. And I, I'm worried about that. Uh, some of the schools may tell you, well, we can't do that. We can't give you what you're asking for because we don't have the money. Well, under the federal law, a lack of money or lack of funding is not an excuse or a defense in special education. Uh, I, in my 20 years, I've had many times where parents would come to me and say, well, my school told me that they don't have the money to do this. Well, in my 20 years, I've never had a school district tell me that they don't have the money because normally they do. And if they tell me that they don't have the money, then I will ask them, ask, I'll just say, well, I'm gonna audit your books. Uh, but having said all that, the pandemic may truly cause some legitimate funding problems with the schools. We, nobody knows. So we're just gonna to have to take that into consideration, wait and see what happens and consult with someone who knows how to help you on these things. Now, what do parents do now about uh, getting benefits for your child? I'm gonna discuss it in two ways. First, the first area is for parents whose child is not on an IEP or on a 504 plan, what do you do? Secondly, for those parents whose child is already on an IEP, what do you do? So let's take the not on the IEP first. The federal law says that if the school or the parent or anybody even suspects that the child is, has a disability, just a suspicion that then the school is required by law to commence what I call a child find evaluation, which is simply a comprehensive psychoeducational evaluation. They've got to do that. And if, they, if the school doesn't volunteer it, you ask, you say, I want my child to be evaluated to see if they can be on an IEP. The, the uh, evaluation testing is really, normally takes about uh, two to three weeks. Now the school under the law has 45 days, but I, I've never seen a school take 45 days in 20 years. Now, when you ask for a child find evaluation, you must sign a consent form that allows the, the district to give your child uh, the uh, evaluation. The school will not start the evaluation unless and until you've signed that consent. So merely asking for the, the evaluation doesn't start anything. You've got to sign the consent form. 
uh, to do that. And I think it's absolutely imperative that you request the evaluation in writing, all right? Um, so after the school then has completed the child find evaluation, they will call for a meeting. And we call this the MEGS, M-E-E-G-S meeting. And at that meeting, the parents are there. The school then presents to the parents the results of the evaluation of their child. They'll either say to the parent, your child does qualify to be on an IEP or does not. If they tell you that the child does not qualify to be on an IEP, you have the right to request an independent educational evaluation, an independent evaluation by a doctor of your choice, and the school has to pay for it. You don't have to tell them why you're dissatisfied or anything else. You just say, look, the law says I can ask for an independent evaluation and I'm asking. Again, I do that in writing. This, you then get to pick the doctor, <coughs> excuse me, to do the IEP, I mean, to do the evaluation. Some schools will give the parents a list of doctors that they would like for the parent to select. You do not have to select the doctor from that list provided by the school. You have the right to ask for a doctor of your choice. And uh, I've, uh, in my years, I've, I've, I've yet used a, one of my doctors for about the last seven or eight years to, to help us. Uh, now, if you're qualified, if you, if you get qualified with the Meigs meeting, uh, then you do, and the school will then have an IEP team meeting and you will have to, you'll be a participant in that. So now let's talk about if your child is already on an IEP or a 504, but I, I'm mainly talking about the IEP. What you must do is you must request in writing to have a team meeting. Make sure you put it in writing. Tell the school in writing that you're going to record the meeting and then record it. You have the right under the law to be, to help select the date and the time for the meeting. Don't just let the school come in and say, hey, we're gonna meet tomorrow or the next day, regardless of what your, your schedule is. No, you have the right to insist on your schedule being considered. Now, the, the date and the attendees at the meeting are these, the parents, of course. There should be a regular education teacher. There should be a, a special education teacher there. Uh, there should be an authorized representative from the district who has the power to make decisions, financial decisions concerning your child. Frequently, the school district does not have that person at the meeting. And you should, if they're not there, you should say, I, I want somebody here who has the power to make a decision, a financial decision on behalf of my child. Um, paras, I, of, I oftentimes ask that a para the, that the child's para attend the meeting. Sometimes I'm successful in that and sometimes I'm not. Um, now, does, should the child attend the meeting? In my 20 years, I've never had a child attend the meeting. Most of, my time, most of the time, the, child, the children are younger and I just don't think it's, it's conducive to, or, to have them at the meeting. Now, if the child gets older, uh, then that's up to the parent to decide. But the, they don't, uh, they, they're not required, uh, the school can't require the child to be there. That's up to the parent. Now, as far as guests attending the IEP team meeting, you may invite guests and they may, they, they, sh they should be able to come. Uh, they tell the guests though that they're not gonna be able to be a participant in the meeting, but they can sit there and give you moral support. Uh, if you're gonna have guests, don't invite the media though. <laughs> that, that would be counterproductive. Now, at every IEP team meeting that I attend, I always present to the team a written document which contains all of the requests that we are going to make to the school at that meeting. I call it my parental request and concerns document. I always do that. Every time you go to the meeting, I'm recording it and I'm presenting a written list of things that we want the, the school to provide for our child. Now, if the, 
if the school denies any parent request that is made at the IEP team meeting, under the law, the school is required to provide the parent with written reasons why their request was denied. Oftentimes the schools do not do that. They simply tell the parent, no, it's denied. We can't do that for whatever reason. You insist, you put it in writing, Madam Principal, put it in writing as to why, because that's what the law says you have to do. Now, do you sign the document or not? I advise parents who are not in agreement with any or all of the terms of the IEP not to sign it. Because once you've signed that IEP and there's something in there that you didn't like, the school later on will say, well, the parent agreed to this. So if you, if you are not in agreement with what's in the IEP, then just you, you don't have to sign it. However, you got to realize this, that the IEP team can implement the IEP, even though you've not signed it, 10 days after the meeting is over. So keep that in mind. Now, the remedies that are available to parents if we can't convince the school uh, to do what we ask about the child are basically twofold. One is mediation, and secondly is a due process complaint. Mediation, uh, the mediators are selected and sent to you uh, from the uh, special ed department of the, of the State Department of Education. Uh, Oftentimes the mediators really are not helpful to us. I've seen that more often than not. However, not too long ago, I got a, a mediator in one of my cases that was excellent. And I think without her, her contributions, we would not have been able to settle the case. So it's gonna depend on who the, who the mediator is. Uh, don't expect a miracle because uh, the, the, the School district does not have to agree to what the mediator says. Now, if that doesn't work and you want to consider due process, I always tell the parent that's that sure should be your last resort. Um, why? Because it's very expensive and it's very time consuming. As far as the expenses go, the law does allow that if the administrative law judge finds that you are the prevailing party then we can demand that the school district pay for your legal fees incurred in going to due process. However, you might have to end up going into federal court to, to, to enforce that. You, you can ask the school, you, we won, we're, we're the prevailing party, pay my attorney for you. And most of the times they will comply, but oftentimes, well, sometimes they don't, you have to go into federal court. So due process, you have to have a lawyer there. I would not recommend you trying to do it yourself. You need a lawyer because the school district is going to have their lawyers and their lawyers are very experienced in this. In, in, when I said it's the last resort, I haven't had to file a due process complaint, I guess in seven years, because we're able to work things out with the school district. So I'm, I'm not an advocate of going to due process at the drop of the hat. Let's try to work with the, with the school, try to be reasonable, try to understand their issues, Hopefully they will try to understand our issues and get it worked out. And, and it, it, I've, I've been very successful in that, not have to go to due to, uh, to process. That concludes my, my topic. Uh, I understand we're gonna be answering some questions and I look forward to those. Uh, I do wanna thank very much uh, Lisa Turner and the other members of TARC for having me on and for giving me the opportunity to speak to so many parents. And I'm looking forward to some really in-depth seminars in the future that will examine specific issues that parents are concerned about in, a, in greater length. So thank you all very much. Thank you, George, for all that very helpful information. Um, we do have several um, really good questions. And so um, we'll start addressing those now. Um, if any of you who haven't submitted a question have one, please go ahead and submit that in the question and answer section. We will do our best to get through as many questions as we can. Um, if we're not able to get to your question on the webinar, we will respond to you at a later um, date. You can also remember email your questions to Sherilyn Walton and we'll show her email um, at the end of the slides. So jumping into <coughs> the questions, George, 
one of the first ones that we have, um, what is, is there a timeline that's required from the time of evaluation until the means takes place? Is that part of the 45 days? Yes, the, the, the law says that the school has 45 days from the request of, for the uh, evaluation to make, to complete the evaluation. Uh, that's, in my experience, we've normally gotten that evaluation done in two to three weeks. Thanks, George. Okay, the next question. Can a school require a student to go through RTI, which is response to intervention, before an evaluation for special ed services? I do not think that they should be allowed to do that. The law does not uh, speak to uh, any type of a delay like the RTI often has. The law doesn't say that you can delay that until uh, delay the evaluation until all that's completed. And I've had some school districts that really do put off the evaluation uh, uh, under the excuse that well, we're running a, a RTI a program. I say, no, you, you're not gonna be, you can do whatever you wanna do, but we want that meeting, um, that evaluation over within 45 days and we want a MEGS meeting um, immediately thereafter. So don't, don't, let the, don't let the school delay the evaluation, the child find evaluation because of, of any reason. Great, um, we have another question here. My, my children are on virtual this year with a public school, but was told they won't have I, an IEP teacher. Would you please address that? Won't have an IEP teacher. Well, they have to have on the IEP team there, there has to be a special education teacher. Now, if they're going virtually, they should have a, a special ed teacher who is conducting the virtual education. You can't just do away with the, with the special ed teacher just because it's virtual. I hope okay. I've answered that. What do I do if the school will not send a Zoom meeting invitation to someone who I want to attend the IEP meeting? Well, that's a good question. Uh, well, as I said, normally speaking, the parent has the right to invite anyone they want to to come to the meeting. The school cannot deny that. So I would say that the school could not refuse to give that person the access to the virtual uh, Zoom meeting. I would just add to that, if you're facing that situation, please call us at TARC and we will help advocate for you in that. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Our next question, George. My child is self-contained all day for 330 minutes, typically before the pandemic. His district knows he's not a candidate for virtual learning. The district is only bringing him back two hours a day, four days a week. Any advice? Okay, I wonder how many, how many school days was he allowed before the pandemic happened? I don't know was, that I can, I don't know that we can yeah. add that, but let's just assume that he was attending normal days. Five days a week. Yes. And now they're going virtual. Again, I think it's going to depend upon what the what the school district has set up for all the students and for special ed teachers, uh, special ed kids. Like like Edmund, for example, um, we were able to convince Edmund to allow the child to go to in person school uh, four days a week. So you you just simply have to ask. You have, I've checked with the TARC and get their help. But you, you've got to just ask the school, I want this or I want that, and see what, try to hope that they will agree with you. And if they don't, well, then you have the remedies that I've outlined here today. Definitely. And again, I just reiterate, reach out to us and we can see how we can assist. Right. Um, okay. The next question I have, this is a long one. 
Um, so my son attends school in the Edmond district. We have three people, myself, my husband, and one of our children in the home that have asthma. So we're doing virtual learning to cut down on COVID exposure. We've been told at the district level that my husband and I have to implement the IEP, that the virtual teacher, that the virtual teacher will have the IEP, but is not expected to implement it. The work my son is having to do is way above his level. Can they do this? Just basically say, sorry, you chose virtual, so you have to implement the IEP and do this work that you normally would not have to do if you're in brick and mortar. Also, he only has two subjects and will not even be exposed to math <clears throat> until November. Well, this, this is a multifaceted question and, and it would take me probably a good hour to talk with the parent and sort out all these things. But again, I emphasize the parent has the right to request anything. Uh, and Edmund has generally been very flexible with me over the years. Um, I don't know how else to, it's a very complicated issue that you're presenting to me. Uh, I think okay. you should ask for whatever you want. I, I think, uh, how many, uh, how many days a week were they talking or just two hours per session? I know this question didn't say that. It's just basically saying that because they've chosen not to, to, to do virtual learning that the parents are going to have to implement the IEP without a teacher. I've never heard of that. Um, I, I would want to talk to Edmund to see if we couldn't convince them of something else. So I would recommend on that one, um, Jamie submitted that. Jamie, if you will email Sherilyn Walton or George after this, both of their email addresses will be listed at the end of the webinar, then they can help you with that. You know, in that if, regard, I've dealt with Edmund for, for 20 years. Uh, they have an excellent special ed director, Nancy Goosen. And uh, over the years, Nancy has been very, very accommodating every time I've ever brought a case to her or a situation to her. So I would want to, uh, I would talk to Nancy in detail and figure out what we could do. And they, you may find out that, uh, that uh, you can accomplish what you want. I think oftentimes these, these principles We'll, we'll have the IEP team meeting and the special ed director doesn't even know about it. So if you bring, if you involve the special education director, at least this is the way it should be, that the special education director is often much more sophisticated about the law and they will go out of their way to help you. Great. Okay, so several more questions are coming in. Um, here's one. If my child has a one-on-one -on -one aid at school, but I've been told aides cannot come to the home during remote learning, is this a school policy that can be reversed? It's a school, it's a school policy that can be challenged. I don't know that they would have to uh, agree because if you're in a virtual environment, that means that the aid is not there. So, but I would ask for it, I would, I would say, can the aide come to my home X number of days a week? You'll probably not get it. You probably won't be able to do that. But you've got to ask for it. And, and uh, see, if they're not going to have an aide, oh, that's a good question. Um, if, they, if the child needed an aide before the pandemic and they were receiving the aide's help, then when they're going remote, she's going to, the child is going to need the aid's help then too. So it may be what the parent asked the school to do is say, well, let my, my child, like in Edmond, go to school in person uh, and, there, and have the aid there available for her. They may not agree, but you got to ask. Okay. Um, this question, my son was previously on an IEP and is now on a 504 plan and has failing grades. Am I able to request another IEP meeting? Very good question. I want parents to know you can have an IEP meeting as often as you want. You should be reasonable about it, of course, but you can have an IEP meeting and you could have another IEP meeting the next week or the next month. There's no limitation on the number of IEP team meetings that you're allowed to ask for. Now, it may get to the point where, you know, uh, what is it 
that you don't understand about no, and you know, we're not gonna have another IEP meeting just to rehash everything we've already told you that we're gonna do. But no, you have the right to have more than one IEP. Matter of fact, most of my cases, we have two or three IEP team meetings, depending upon the, the, the nature of, uh, and the difficulty of the issues involved. This is another big topic that I believe will probably be one of the things that we address in our October series. But um, for older students with disabilities, a transition program as talked about and decided in high school. If the original plan included community involvement or work, how does an IEP team proceed if community locations are not open to this experience due to the pandemic? And then the second question is, can parents request compensatory services after COVID? Let's take the first one, uh, Lisa. Read the first part of that question back to me again. Sure, it's, it's saying that their student is on a, is, um, in the transition period, and so part of the transition plan is for that student to go out into the community and do community engagement and work. However, the locations are closed right now amidst the pandemic. So what, um, what can the parent do in this situation when transition-related services are unable to be performed at this time? That's a real good question. Again, this is a unique question that arises in the pandemic. Uh, obviously, if the child before the pandemic was able to go out into stores and work in a store, work in a, a nursery or whatever it is, but if that nursery or that store is, is closed, then they, they're not gonna be able to participate in that. I'm just brainstorming at this point, but you know, maybe the, maybe the parent could take the child themselves to some, some of these environments themselves if, if, if you have a store that's still open. And I know that may not be a real good answer, but I, you, you should talk to Tark or me or somebody and walk through that more because that's a complicated issue. Yeah, we're getting a couple of other questions related to now, that. Now as what, well. about, what about the second question though, second part of that question, uh, Lisa? The second part of that question was, can they, re, can they request compensatory services once um, returning to school? Yes, but, uh, let me, let me tell you that I didn't address compensatory education at this point because it's very complicated. I would like for us to have one of our sessions later this year devoted only to compensatory education. But yes, you can ask for a compensatory education if your child was denied FAPE as a result of the pandemic. <coughs> I hope that answers the question. Thank you. So another question, we, we never finished our IEP from February because of COVID. We did not sign it. Are you saying that the IEP for this year is in place? We asked another evaluation. We asked for another evaluation since she did not meet any goals from the last IEP. In February, the school refused to comply. What should we do next? Well, you can ask, number one, if I understand the question right, uh, correctly, you can ask for an IEP right now and go in there and say, look, we, uh, we had an IEP in February. It, uh, uh, it wasn't completed or the school didn't agree with what we asked for. So we're coming back in now and we're making our presentation at this new IEP meeting. Request, put your requests in writing and record the meeting. But yes, you have the right to have another IEP right now and, and try to, uh, you know, to try to get whatever you want to request the school to do. Thank you, George. Okay, this, um, this is a question with um, an email that the mother received from a special education teacher talking about as part of the contingency plan, in case of future school closure, the special services division is developing plans that will lead to a smooth transition from in-school learning to distance learning. I will be developing these plans through the month of September and will send home your students' contingency plan for review and finalizing. I'll get in touch with you via phone or email in order to get input and complete the work. 
I've begun contacting parents. So if you and I have already discussed this, please disregard your email. The parent is concerned that the plan is being created without the parent's input. Um, looks like that the parent can review it and ask for what is needed. Um, does the school have a way to provide for all students to accent virtual content? Saying. So basically it sounds like the school is wanting to provide a plan to the student um, and just have the parent review. So two questions, what can the parent do in that situation? And then does the school have to provide a way for all students, including special education students to access virtual content? Well, I'm gonna address the situation involving a special ed uh, child. Uh, the school cannot force a change in the special education child's placement or IEP without holding an IEP team meeting with the parent being there. So they, they can't just pick up the phone or send you an email and say, well, from now on, we're gonna do this for your child who has special needs. Uh, they can do that, but then you immediately then in writing ask for an IEP team meeting and you have to go to that meeting and attend it and present your, your desires in writing to the school. So yeah, they can't just, they can't just, you know, say, well, we're, this is what we're going to do for your child. Now they may, they may say, well, this is what the school is going to do for all the children, but remember, the IEP is an individualized education plan. So you have the right to say, I want to have an individual meeting to, to, to adopt an individual plan for my child or program for my child. Any, okay. Anytime you all have a question about any of these things that you don't, uh, that you run into, please call uh, Tark or call me uh, and uh, we'll spend the time to help you uh, kind of figure it out. But some of these questions are complicated and you can't, you, it takes some time in discussing to be able to solve them. Okay, so here's a couple of other questions that aren't as complicated. Um, <laughs> so if my child needs related services, but the school does not have enough providers, what is the school required to provide? Okay. Under the law, the school is required to provide the, the student with therapists in any related service. It's no excuse for the school to say, we don't have the money to hire somebody. It's no excuse to say we've, uh, well, what happens oftentimes is they say we've advertised for uh, a therapist and we just can't find anybody. Well, maybe the school needs to increase the offer to well, on the compensation of this therapist. So it, it's not an excuse for the school to say, well, we just don't have enough therapists to go around. Well, you've got to go out and hire some. That's my okay. um, Another question is, um, and there's a few related to this, if, if these school options do not work for us, can we just pull our child out of school until things settle down and have them pick up where they left off grade-wise when we do go back to school? Excellent question. Uh, if you're unsatisfied with what the school is offering you, you do have the option of, of homeschooling your child. Uh, Oklahoma has an, uh, a um, homeschool law. I've had a lot of clients over the years who have resorted to homeschooling their child with, with success, quite frankly. Uh, you also have the right to ask that the child be placed in, a, in what we call a homebound placement which means that they are so they remain at home, but your district school has to provide certain services in, uh, with that child, like uh, related services. They bring the, they also would bring the, the homework to the school, to the child and have tests given to the child and all that. Um, but yeah, if you can't get them, you, you either gonna have to homeschool your child um, or uh, you can go online and, and, and get on, get with some of these online schools. And related to that, um, it said if the child is homeschooled, can the school district or will the school district provide PT and OT services? No, if, the, if your child is being homeschooled, the, 
district school has no obligation to offer you anything. However, if your child is, is in a homebound placement, that is with the consent of your district, homeschool district, then the homeschool district does have to provide certain benefits and, and services to your child. But if you're strictly homeschooling the child, your district school has no obligation. Okay, it looks like we have time for one or two more questions. So um, this parent says that they've enrolled their student in a virtual um, school for the time being, um, but they've heard that their regular school district will not allow them to come back mid-year if they want to change that. That's an interesting question. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that that is legal. Uh, for example, if that particular district will allow a student to enroll in the middle of a school year, but let's say they move in from out of state and they, they're in, in Tulsa uh, school district and they, they want to enroll. This, Tulsa can't deny them the right to enroll. So why would they be able to deny the child to enroll when they're coming out of a homeschool environment? There again, you know, you'd have to you'd have to find out what how the school treats uh, kids who are coming in from out of state, for example, or just moving from Tulsa to Oklahoma City, for example, and they want to enroll in the Oklahoma City public school system. Is there any rule that says that uh, they can be prevented from enrolling? And if there's not, then then uh, there's no uh, there's no justifiable reason for, to deny that child to enroll anytime they want to. Thanks, I hope I've answered George. that question. Thanks, George. We do have another, a few other questions submitted through the question and answers that I think um, we'll have to respond to via email. If your question was not answered, um, please email those. Um, I'm just looking through one more time to make sure there's not anything else. Okay, here's one more. Uh, last one and then, um, so since my child is on an IEP meeting, do we have to choose a strictly virtual or on-site option? For instance, it seems like students may lose contact with their teacher of record if they choose vir virtual. Well, again, I go back to the the, the parent has the right at the IEP team meeting to request whatever you want to request. For example, you could say, uh, I, want to, I want to be in person four days a week, or I, uh, you know, you can, you can ask for any of those things, and I would. You don't have to just accept whatever the school says they're going to do uh, when, you, when you are a child with, uh, with special needs. It, it, if you're a child, if your child is not uh, have special needs, they're what we call typical children, uh, then they pretty well are, are obligated to do whatever the school presents to them as far as how they're going to be educated. But if you have a child with special needs, then you have the right to ask the school to make exceptions. Uh, and you, you've got to ask for it. And again, those are those things where you're going to need guidance uh, on how to approach it and how to, what to do about it. Thank you, George. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we know that the school year is just beginning and that we're all trying to figure this out. That's why we're teaming up with George to bring you an entire series of special education webinars during the month of October. By that time, we suspect many of you will have a better idea of what's working and what's not. We all have to remember that no one has this figured out, but TARC and George are here to help. The October web webinar series will dive into more specific topics related to special education. Tomorrow, you'll receive an email with a survey link which will ask you what topics you would like to be addressed during that webinar series. Please take time to respond to the survey and be sure to follow us on social media to get details on the upcoming webinar series. Now, I know many of you had more specific questions that aren't necessarily, um, that we don't have the time to address today. So, I urge you to contact TARC to email Sherilyn or George, and we will get those. Uh, we'll be happy to assist you with your personal questions. Um, again, Sherilyn's email is swalton at ddadvocacy.net. 
Thank you all again for joining us today. Please stay connected with us and reach out with questions that you didn't get answered today or any that you think of or that come up later. Again, we're here to help and thank you again and have a wonderful day.